The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have with us two scholars who are both visiting fellows at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, Sam Abrams, who focuses on questions related to civic and political culture, and Brad Wilcox, who is focused on the National Marriage Project, which is a really fascinating study that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to be here, Marshall. Joel, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I, the the first thing, uh, really, and I, I maybe I'll start with Brad, um, since you've got a book on the topic, um, is marriage in as much trouble um, as is being alleged? And if so, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and the answer to the question, Joel, is yeah, marriage is in trouble. There's no question okay. about that. We've seen uh, the marriage rate, for instance, fall by about 65% since 1970, the, the year that I was born. And we're projecting that probably about a third of young adults today will never marry, maybe even more than that. Um, and this is just kind of record demographic territory um, that we're sort of seeing unfold in American life. Obviously, plenty of folks also get divorced as well. So, you know, sort of the hold that marriage has over our culture, our society is much weaker today than it was, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and we don't see kind of any immediate prospect of a U-turn, um, although I'm doing, <laughs> doing my small part to try to, uh, to make that happen. Um, but yeah, it's, it's happening. And why is that a problem, though? I think it's the, obviously is the question you're asking us to think about. And so from an economic perspective, just to take in some ways, um, well, one of the, the things you could sort of look at, we know that kind of the health of marriage and family life is one of the best predictors of economic mobility for poor kids across America, based obviously on Raj Chetty's work. He finds in looking at communities that, you know, when you sort of look at race, you look at economic inequality, look at school, you know, policies, these things all matter when it comes to how to kind of lifting kids' fortunes from poor backgrounds. But the number one factor is the share of single parent families in the community. Um, and so that's kind of gives you some sense of the economic story here. Um, there's been obviously a lot of, of um, concern on the rise in deaths and despair. We keep setting records when it comes to suicide, for instance, and other, you know, things related to overdoses, you know, to this death of despair phenomenon. And we know that marriage is a big protective factor there. Um, and that these deaths of despair are concentrated among never married guys and divorced guys who don't have college degrees. Um, so that's kind of another example of how this is playing out. And then more recently, in the last, I think, week and a half or so, there was a new study from Chicago, University of Chicago, indicating that declines in happiness are primarily related to um, declines in the share of American adults who are married. And of course, if you know anything about kind of marriage and class in America today, you know that those those declines have been unfortunately concentrated among working class and poor Americans. There's a growing happiness divide too. So that's just kind of a quick, you know, response to some of the factors, economic and in sort of in a sense, medical and psychological to give you a sense of why we should be concerned about this uh, shift. Uh, Sam, I know you, you specialize in attitudes. What atti attitude changes have taken place that may be driving this? So we should definitely talk about what's going on on college and university campuses, attitudes toward dating, cohabitation, uh, attitudes toward faith, uh, you know, it, it really play a huge role here. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of Brad's uh, comments for a second about uh, the loneliness epidemic and the crisis of isolation. I can't stress that enough. This is so high. We spend a lot of time studying this uh, now at AEI and trying to make sense of what, what's going on here. And, and, and marriage and families are a gateway to managing this crisis, to opening up doors, to being more social. Another study came out last week that basically talked about levels of happiness and uh, dislocation are, are, are different when you're in a married couple socializing with another married, married couple. There are um, just incredible benefits here um, cognitively that that we are losing by by seeing the disintegration of marriage and family that way in in terms of attitudes 
things are tracking in a very scary way here. And, and Joel, you and I talked about this in, in our article where we're seeing younger folks say they don't like these institutions. We see younger folks less connected to old school institutions, whether they're, they're um, clubs in New York City, whether they're to, to uh, sporting events uh, and, and you know socializing in, say, a park. Uh, we see lower numbers uh, going to church and engaging in church. So it's it, it, we we see this sort of perfect storm of of just the decline of a whole host of institutions, um, the rise of these horrible black faced. Although those are my kids, so let me try it again. Black faced square boxes, and you know, you know, dependency on looking at screens and and forgetting how to engage and interact with others. Uh, I, I being in liberal arts college spend uh, a huge amount of time with undergrads and it's pretty tough for me to watch how difficult it is for many of them to socialize they don't know how to engage they're very happy to to, to communicate over TikTok, over text but to just have a conversation at lunch is is epic it's sarah lawrence and again this is not empirical so i want to be very careful about that and you know i can't speak to uva although i'm sure you'll see it i see it all the time here in new york just when i'm eating on on the go by myself but I can't tell you how many restaurants now you go into, and we're not talking about necessarily fast casual, but sit down restaurants where the person's eating alone and they're looking at their phone. Uh, we're losing the art of socialization. We're losing the art of um, intimacy and maintaining intimacy. And then we want to know why we have so much rudeness, why we're so angry, why we can't relate to other people. Uh, David Brooks has that piece in The Atlantic that just came out, of, uh, and, it, and it's directly related to this. We are losing the capacity to negotiate and work with others. So, so we see when, that in all the attitudes. When you think about the underlying causes, you know, one of the senses that I get is that we're moved into a world where time compression has really taken over as a major variable in everybody's lives. And part of that is driven, of course, through technologies, um, the constant drive for improving productivity, you know, uh, that is foisted upon us in the workplace. To what degree is time compression really driving this? Or are there other insidi more insidious things that are going on that are eroding the level of intimacy and communication that people have? Well, I mean, I would certainly echo Sam's point about the impact of these devices on our um, on our lives. I think that sort of the rise of screen culture since around 2010 has had a precipitous impact on everything from dating to sex to marriage to uh, fertility. Um, I was looking at fertility trends, you know, back in the early 2010s and thinking that as the economy rebounded, we would see an increase in fertility again. And we did not see that. And I think part of the reason we didn't see that was that sort of the impact of screens was kind of taking hold. So that's, that's part of the story. I think the sort of point you make about efficiency is also part of the story in Marshall as well. Um, obviously, there's just a lot of sort of this kind of it's the perfect storm. Like, why is marriage and family life, why, and fertility? And obviously, we've seen Joel write about these topics as well in his report on post familialism, um, which is great. But you know, just have you've got individualism culturally, you have secularism culturally, you have many men are are basically floundering, um, which makes them less marriageable, both in their own eyes and the eyes of their potential partners. Um, we have in the United States marriage penalties that basically make marriage less appealing economically to working class couples with kids. Um, you know, this is, and then you know, our our elites are just you know, really not great on this issue. I mean, they, they they talk left oftentimes to kind of minimize, for instance, the importance of marriage and family in their public authoritative roles as like school superintendents, as college professors, as journalists, as C-suite executives. Um, and then in their own private lives, they tend to be very prudent about getting married and staying married and having kids in that stable married context. So that's a huge problem as well, and part of this dynamic playing out. So that's just a quick sense of, I think, some of the factors, cultural and, and legal and um, economic, and then also just there's a failure of elites to really kind of stand up and basically um, talk in favor of that which they're doing in private. Uh, is that um, a reflection of, of the elite class's fear of the you know the progressive or woke whatever term you want to use that there'll be a backlash or if if I'm the you know if I'm the head of a bank and I get up and say I think one of our key issues is marriage and family 
are they afraid of what the backlash is going to be? Yeah, Joel, I think that's certainly, and Sammy can jump in here too, but I, I mean, I, you know, I know uh, an assistant dean here at EPA who is, you know, has a very marriage friendly attitude, um, likes the work that I do, um, but doesn't feel comfortable articulating that in his official position, you know, here at the University of Virginia. So I think, um, and there, I think, you know, and we know on, on this whole issue of sort of culture and authority today in America, there are many such cases on many, such, on many issues besides just marriage. So that, that's a problem with the, the progressive character of our public culture today. Yes. Well, and the focus has been so heavily on including groups that have been unincluded historically sure. in the past, right? right. It, it seems kind of a, a natural reaction to kind of gloss over the majority group or the, the what has been the social norm for so many people in the world. And is that really kind of what we're seeing is just kind of the the, uh, the long tail effect of of uh, the the drive to include. If you think about some of the rhetoric uh, among the most progressive folks, you, you know it, it's so heavily focused on inclusion that if you fixate on these older school institutions, which obviously have existed and have persisted so long because of the values that I think we've all made very clear, um, if you focus on that, people will feel excluded and you know you see that very very strongly here in new york in the ultra progressive uh world we have in new york think about the last handful of mayors they have not had or, or even donald trump which i really don't want to talk too much about but you know we're not modeling healthy uh really great marriages and really great family life uh, bill de blasio had an unusual marriage it's going through very a very public divorce now our current mayor is very powerfully and proudly a bachelor uh, you know, Mike Bloomberg had a number of previous spouses. Uh, we don't even need to talk about Rudy Giuliani and, <laughs> and, and you know, the situation we have with him. So, uh, you know, we're electing leaders who are not necessarily mirroring and, uh, you know, these sorts of values and projecting these sorts of values. But on the progressive political side of it, I, I think, you know, especially it's a group that is trying to be inclusive with, uh, you know, LGBTQA plus uh, communities and so on. I think they're afraid to say we like the idea of marriage, even though, quite frankly, anyone can marry any almost anybody now legally in this country. So I think it's sort of uh, in political science, we call it sorting. I think these things have just sort of sorted. So you see a lot of folks on the progressive left just not taking up this this issue. Uh, and I think that's a I think that's a huge mess. I think it would be, you know, I, I think this is a powerful institution. And I don't think there's anything wrong saying marriage is a, a good thing. You know, Brad, in your neck of the woods, um, it seems like Glenn Youngkin is actually doing, is appealing to the core nature of marriage and parenting and the notion of a family and is generating quite a bit of uh, popular support in Virginia. Is that something you see as extensible beyond Virginia or does it just happen to be an artifact of where you are? Yeah, I think um, Governor Youngkin has been articulating a very kind of parent-centered approach to a variety of issues, obviously, particularly kind of ed reform issues, you know, education issues. And he is, he is quite popular here in the state of Virginia right now. So I think he does kind of, you know, give us an alternative model between what we see, you know, in much of the, you know, Democratic and Republican parties today. Um, and we'll see if anyone in the near future has either him or someone else has the capacity to kind of take a more, um, you know, a prudential, but also broadly popular approach to these issues. So, yeah, I, I would agree that's a, that's a, an accurate assessment, Marshall. Because it doesn't seem to, you know, from what you're saying, I mean, Youngkin seems to be approaching it in a very sort of constructive way. But I, I think that, you know, whenever you bring up issues, and I mean, just in conversations with, you know, with people that you hear all the time is, well, but look at DeSantis or look at, you know, the the, the far right positions, which immediately alienate, you know, if you, you know, if you're, if you're worried about gay marriage in, in you know, in, in, uh, in 2023, you're kind of behind the curve. Um, is, is there something that, that people who are pro-family can do differently? Because it does seem that, that the, those who try to identify with family very often alienate almost everybody else. 
is there any change of how you can do it? Uh, um, well, you know, just to yeah, quick, great... jump in, what what Youngkin is doing, just to right. just to kind of set that table, is he is separating the issue of abortion from family, and um, not focusing on. And when you the minute you start bringing up the issue of um, family, abortion creeps into it, and that's where the polarization seems to happen politically. And he seems to be successful at separating those issues out. I don't know. That's my sense of it. What's your sense, Brad and Sam? Well, yeah, I mean, I think a part of the issue with Youngkin, too, is that he has a Democratic Senate and a Republican House here in Virginia. So his sort of options for maneuver are, are clearly constrained. And I think that's one reason he is kind of taking a more politically moderate position on this. But I think, at least right now, I think one reason he's been more popular is he's been addressing two issues that I think are broadly pro-family. One is he's been tackling kind of the high cost of living with some you know, specific things on, on taxes. Um, so I think if you can recognize that all families basically are struggling today to uh, pay for their you know, basic expenses in terms of things like you know, rent or mortgages or groceries, you know, that's, that's part of the solution today, that economic piece. Um, and then I think most ordinary American parents um, would like to have some degree of you know, authority and, and buy-in and influence and access to what's happening in their kids' schools. Um, and I mean, I've spoken to plenty of people who are you know, pro-choice or pro-gay marriage, um, but are just uh, literally appalled by what they're seeing play out in their kids' public schools. And they're absolutely afraid that their kids are going to be captured by um, the ideological character of a lot of our public school education. So I think Governor Youngkin has recognized that and is trying to address as best he can from Richmond, you know, that that dynamic and is, is popular for it as well. So that's, I think, the, the cultural story here is can we kind of just tame the culture in public schools and give parents more influence, access, and then choices when the public schools are failing, you know, to do a good job of educating the kids. So from a political science perspective, I mean, I, I, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time down in Virginia, largely because that's where my in-laws are. And I was there for uh, quite a few election cycles, actually, during uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, and my uh, in-laws actually ran for uh, attorney, uh, no, lieutenant governor. So I know the state fairly well. Um, you know, Youngkin is practicing uh, what I would say is old school um, retail politics, and and he's focused on issues that matter to everyone. Cross, you know, cross cutting a whole bunch of cleavages here. This is hugely important. He is not fixated on some of the hot button culture war issues the way we see in in, in other states. Um, so I think that's been very, very useful. You know, he's being very savvy about it. And then to, to Brad's point of uh, divided government, I mean, divided government's a good thing. We know for the most part that when you have divided government, as is the case in the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, it does lead to better policy outcomes and, and thing actually more often gets passed because you have to collaborate, you have to work and have to find some sort of more moderated position. Um, it's hard to argue with some of the things that that Governor Youngkin is trying to do. Um, affordability is critical. Um, it's certainly a, a big issue here in New York, but you know nothing's going to get through because nothing's going to work with such an extreme progressive group, and people are going to always fight to to shut it down. And then one of the most important drivers, and this is again clear political science, for getting communities and people engaged is schooling. You know, if you look time and time again, what is the what what is going to compel people to vote and engage in their communities and this is uh taking a cue from the work of david campbell at notre dame and my former office mate uh, back at harvard it's the schools and control over your schools and getting involved in your schools and having some say in what's being taught and how it's being taught this is something i'm trying to navigate for my kids here in new york and it is a uh, little bit of a challenge trying to figure this out so youngkin's playing it beautifully and you know he's wise enough to know and i would tell any politician you have to if you want to drive turnout if you want to bring uh, more attention to your campaign and your issues talk about schools and talk about returning power to what's being taught to the parents now a lot of administrators hate this the teachers hate this the teachers always often say well we have master's degrees we know what we're doing uh, most of these master's degrees uh, come from you know captured ed schools uh, that are about as liberal and progressive as humanly possible, parents don't like that. And uh, they, they want to say in their community, they want to say in their schooling. So uh, Governor Youngkin's playing this very, very, very smartly. Uh, and uh, I think other politicians should take note, quite frankly. But what I'm, what I'm wondering about is, okay, I mean, you, you guys have laid things out really well. 
what can we do about it? What can we do economically? What can we do with education policy? How, how do we turn this around? Because it seems to me at the end of the day, you're in brave new world territory if it doesn't reverse. So I think, um, you know, Joel, I think the challenges here are just enormous. I don't think there's any going to be any quick fix. Um, and I think part of the problem is that, you know, marriage has become kind of um, perceived as a, as a right-wing thing, as a religious thing. Um, I just did a, an analysis of the American Family Survey and found particularly for college educated adults, there's about a 60 percentage point difference in their views about the value of marriage for children between conservative college educated adults and self-identified liberal college educated adults. Not surprisingly, less educated Americans are more in the middle, right? But so our elites, and obviously they're primarily liberal, are really super discounting the value and importance of marriage. Our conservative elites, by contrast, are much more marriage oriented um, and more so than ordinary Americans as well. So that's a huge problem. I mean, if we don't have the majority of our elites kind of understanding and appreciating how much marriage matters um, and being willing to articulate that and pursue policies, you know, um, that would be congruent with that reality, we're in trouble. But to your question, what can we do kind of, you know, sort of in terms of if we had a policy lever to pull? But I think things like eliminating the marriage penalty in our means of the programs, I think things like pushing the success sequence in public schools is the idea that getting at least a high school degree, working full time and married for having kids puts in adults at a tremendous economic advantage would be helpful. Um, I think um, in terms of affordability issues, thinking about you know, a generous child tax credit, both at the federal and the state levels, but one that doesn't kind of um, allow for a kind of, of class of people who are simply reliant upon the government to rise you know, as you know, as an important caveat there. Um, and I think tackling issues of affordability for people in terms of thinking about family formation, that goes to everything from college debt to um, housing reform. You know, it's sort of those key things in terms of, you know, both housing and education and healthcare. If we can kind of figure out new and innovative ways to, um, you know, bring the cost of those three uh, core goods down um, that would make it easier for folks to afford um, getting married and having kids, um, you know, in, in today's economy. So those are some ideas about things that would be helpful. Um, but I, I think the cultural kind of logic that's unfolding right now in terms of its individualism and its workism is making it difficult for people to prioritize marriage and love in ways that lead a lot of them to kind of uh, misuse their 20s and then set them up for difficulty when it comes to getting married and having kids, you know, in their um, in their 30s. Sam, what would you add in your so, make, yes, no, the, the magic wand? Yes. So um, I like what everything Brad said. I would add two things. As someone who has a five week old little boy, uh, his name is Zach. Congratulations. Uh, you know, first, we need comprehensive plans for paternity and maternity leave, like we see in, in the Nordics and so on. Uh, not always easy to do here. I was very lucky that I was able to work something out. Uh, I know far too many people who have not been able to work things out. The affordability mm -hmm. issue is is enormous. Paying for childcare is is a real drain on most people and is a problem. The the other thing I I would do and it, it's sort of a two prong thing is uh, I would try to get young people to stop going to therapy as much as they do. Mm -hmm. I think therapy is very useful. But if you look at so, and, and this is this is stuff that people write about, if you look at so much cognitive behavioral therapy of late, it's about finding your authentic self. I'm a huge believer in finding your authentic self. But finding your authentic self doesn't mean you destroy all the institutions around you, you ignore your friends and your family, and you ignore your social obligations and the other sort of things that you are necess necessarily part of. But if you look at what the cognitive behavioral therapy work is doing, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate mail after saying this, mm -hmm. it encourages so much individualism, uh, so much, I'll even go as far as to say selfishness, and it throws off norms and bonds of reciprocity, community, and collaboration. Uh, when, you know, we see, I see this constantly in New York. I see this constantly when trying to hire uh, when I tried to hire a couple of babysitters here and there, you know, well, they just didn't feel like working today. It wasn't what they wanted to do. It's like, and then you find, and then you talk to them a little bit more and you realize eventually, ah, I see where this is coming from. We see this constantly on campuses among uh, students uh, who are overwhelmingly in therapy. And again, 
<laughs> figuring out who you are is valuable, but there are limits and you still exist it within a social construct that's old school social 101, not anymore social 101. And, uh, you know, speaking of social 101, that's the related point, which is, uh, at least in the New York City schools, we need faculty who themselves are married and have families. I can tell you that huge numbers of faculty I know, and again, this is not empirical, this is observational, so I, I enter that caveat, uh, are not partnered up. They're encouraged uh, you know, they, they discourage marriage, they discourage, um, you know, sort of making those trade offs. So if you put that uh, in line with the whole kind of behavioral therapy approach of saying, look, you don't have to compromise, you don't have to work with others. Uh, it's all about yourself and you can explore. Well, by the time you're 35 and trying to figure this out, it's a lot harder to date. People are a lot more set in their ways. Uh, we do have biological clocks. I don't care what you want to identify as. But for a lot of people, uh, fertility becomes harder as you age. Uh, I'm very aware of that with my own kids. And, you know, all of these things collectively yield, especially among our elites who go to college, this feeling that marriage is, is an anachronistic old school institution. We don't need it. Why are we bothering doing it? And by the way, if you do it, you're not being your authentic self. Who are you to give part of yourself into a marriage and a family? This is all about you and you figure it out. And then maybe later you'll get married if you want. And then on top of that, by the way, again, thanks to this lovely phone, you know, when you have certain needs, sexual and, and so on, the number of students who use the apps to simply hook up and experience those sexual needs outside of an intimate, committed relationship, uh, you know, they're, they're fulfilling those through those other channels. So for a lot of people, why get married? Why tie yourself down? Yeah. Although it's hard That's to imagine a society that will perpetuate itself by simply swiping right. Exactly. But, you know, this is what this is what we see. And, and my students regularly tell me they either jump into, you know, these very intense, committed relationships and they say my partner in two weeks or if they have certain needs, they'll achieve them through apps. It's a little strange. Little. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's very weird. The, the art of socialization and, and dating and going back and forth and learning uh, is, is, is disappearing. And, and this is why, you know, as we talked about at the start, we have all these other larger social implications about why it's promoting loneliness, why it's promoting uh, more social enemy, because we don't know how to talk and uh, work across difference. Well, gentlemen, as we as we wrap up, I, this, I would be remiss if we didn't tell our audience about Brad's new book that's going to be coming out in the spring from Harper. Brad, you want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, thanks, Marshall. It's called uh, Get Married, Why Americans Should Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. Um, and I, I just announced it on Twitter this week, and there's been some pushback on this idea of elites. And they're saying, well, isn't it the case that our elites are doing great when it comes to marriage? So why is it about defy the elites? Well, the point of the book is that, in part, is that unfortunately, a lot of the messages that our elites are giving are more kind of in the me first spirit rather than the we first spirit. And of course, it's the we first spirit that's the key to forging a strong marriage and a good family. And so I talk about a variety of ways in the book that couples can have a kind of family first orientation, a kind of we first orientation that ends up being good for their kids and their spouse and, and them. In fact, one of the things I see in the research is that generosity in marriage, not being the recipient of generosity, but being the generous spouse um, for both women and men is just a fantastic predictor of marital quality. So that's part of what's going on in, in this new book on marriage for Harper. Well, it sounds fantastic. And we're looking forward to reading it. I, I, I personally can't wait to, to crack it open. It sounds fantastic. Sam and Brad, thank you so much for being uh, guests here on this on the Feudal Future podcast, and we look forward to having you back sometime in the future for a follow up. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Marshall. Thanks, Joel. The Feudal Future.